We're all born with different genetics. Some parts of our body are stronger than others. And then we enter the world, and nowadays it's a pretty toxic place. We have heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium, aluminum. We have chemicals like pesticides and solvents and artificial colors and flavors. And these tend to accumulate in our genetic weak spots. What ends up happening is the toxins accumulate there and they drop the electrical potential of the cell, the voltage. Think of every cell like a small battery and when it's healthy it's got a good electrical charge. The toxins end up lowering the charge on the cells. You see, with every bite of food we eat, we're eating the spores of bacteria and yeast and the eggs of parasites. We're not sterile and our environment isn't either. Now, normally this isn't a problem. These spores and eggs will pass through our body and move along. They're looking to compost. That's their job. They're composters. And as long as we're healthy, they won't see us as a food source. But what happens is, if our cell voltage is low enough, we look like a compost pile to them and they start breaking us down. That's not to say that there aren't aggressive pathogens out there. There are, but 99% of the infections that we get are chronic opportunists and we've given them the opportunity. What happens is they start growing. The eggs are stimulated to hatch. The spores are stimulated to open up and grow. In the case of parasites, it could range from the microscopic up to some worms that are several feet in length. When you combine the weak genetic tissue with low cell voltage, with heavy metals, chemical toxins, parasites, yeast, bacteria, and the biofilms they make, the body has a very difficult time dealing with this. It ends up becoming a kind of chronic wound. And eventually, the body decides to create scar tissue. A scar in this manner can be understood as a wound that's failed to heal properly. Here are two microscopic images of mouse muscle. The one on the left is from a young mouse, equivalent to a 20-year-old human. The one on the right is an older mouse, equivalent to an 80-year-old human. You can count 20 healthy muscle cells on the left, but on the right, only 10 muscle cells remain. The rest of the slide is dark. The dark area is the scar tissue that has accumulated over the mouse's lifespan. And of the 10 cells that remain, you can see that four of them have faded out. These are called senescent cells, that is, cells that are old, barely functioning, and on their way to becoming scar tissue. In order to rejuvenate this mouse, we would need to clear up the scar tissue and get the senescent cells to self-destruct. Now look at these two mice. They're the same age. The younger looking mouse was genetically engineered to have senescent cells self-destruct. So no senescent cells and no scar tissue either. That's why it looks so young. It's also unlikely that the younger looking mouse will ever develop cancer, since many cancers develop out of senescent cells and scar tissue. If we want to be able to age gracefully, we're going to need to find a way to trigger senescent cells to self-destruct and to remove scar tissue. If a person doesn't have any obvious genetic weaknesses, then scarring happens systemically and across the entire body as we age. But some of us have parts of our bodies that are weaker than others. When scarring shows up more aggressively in one place than another, this is what we recognize as symptoms. When it shows up across the whole body, it's aging. But in one place in particular, this is where the disease process starts being recognized. This can happen anywhere in the body. Scarring in the lungs is asthma, COPD, emphysema, or cystic fibrosis. Scarring in the breasts would be fibrocystic breasts, and in the uterus, fibroids. 
Scarring in the arteries would be arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. In the skin, scleroderma. In the muscles, fibromyalgia. It could really show up in any part of the body you could imagine. In men, it shows up as Peyronne's disease, which is scarring of the penis. 23% of all men on autopsy have so much scarring in their sexual organ that it is actually twisting, and it's a source of a lot of erectile dysfunction in men. No organ is immune to this. It's estimated that 45% of deaths and most chronic diseases are associated with scarring. So, what can we do about it? Well, we need to dissolve the scars, then get rid of those opportunistic infections, then get rid of the metals and chemicals that cause them to see us as composting material. If we can do all that, then we can get our health back. For metals, I prefer EDTA chelation. Usually it's given by IV because it does not survive the digestion, but there is a way to take it as a suppository. Mercury redeposition is when a chelator grabs onto the mercury and then releases it to another site in the body. This is a potential with DMPS, DMSA, or EDTA because they can let go of the mercury depending on the chelator for lead, chromium, or iron. The best solution for this is to add some selenium to your chelator. Selenium makes a very strong bond with mercury. Elemental mercury it will bond to as mercury selenide, and methyl mercury it will bond to as bis methyl mercuric selenide. When you add selenium to your chelator, any mercury that the chelator lets go of gets bound to selenium, and this it holds on to quite well. My favorite way for getting rid of toxic chemicals is a two-stage process. Coffee and glutathione. You've probably heard of coffee enemas. The way they work is they stimulate an enzyme in the liver called glutathione S transferase, whose job it is to attach the toxic chemical to glutathione. The challenge is, if you do a coffee enema and you don't have enough glutathione, there's nothing for the transferase enzyme to attach the toxin to. That's why the coffee enemas today don't work as well as they used to in the past. People are very low on glutathione. On the other hand, the issue with glutathione is it has to be taken either by IV or suppository. It does not survive digestion. So what I like to do is to use a mix of glutathione and organic coffee as a suppository. This way we stimulate the glutathione as transferase enzyme in the liver with coffee and at the same time give the glutathione to the body so that the transferase enzyme has something to attach the toxin to. Liver gallbladder flushes are a great old-time remedy. They involve drinking copious amounts of olive oil and Epsom salts. The Epsom salts dilate the sphincter of odi, the gateway through which the gallstones would have to pass. It's an intense protocol. I think it's better to slowly melt the gallstones and let them pass naturally, rather than try to force giant gallstones out a narrow passage. The way I like to do this is with chanka piedra and some other herbs and amino acids. If you put them in as a suppository, they're right there by the portal vein and they can go right to the liver. A healing crisis is what happens when you try to detox someone before you open up their water and fat soluble detox pathways. Water-soluble toxins leave through the kidneys, and fat-soluble toxins come through the bile via the liver and gallbladder. If someone's having a detox crisis, odds are their kidneys or their liver and gallbladder haven't been flushed out yet. 
Another possibility for this is if the lymphatic system is clogged up. So my suggestion is before starting a good detox, clean out the kidneys, the liver, gallbladder, and lymphatic channels. Then if you do have a healing crisis, it'll be minimal. Up until about 150 years ago, 95% of the population lived on farms. And we knew that a couple of times a year, everyone in the household, humans, pets, and all the livestock needed to be dewormed. While most of us no longer live on farms, we still have a high parasite load. It's estimated that 30% of Americans have a brain parasite called Toxoplasma gondii, possibly affecting their behavior. Parasites have been around for 500 million years, fungi for 2.4 billion years, and in that time, just through brute force, mutation, and evolution, they've learned to crack our code, to find our weak spots, and to take advantage of us. In that same time frame, plants have also been dealing with fungi and parasites. They've co-evolved, so they've also developed a defense against them. The reason humans and animals don't have great parasitic and fungal defense mechanisms is because we haven't had to. All you have to do is go into the forest and smell around for a plant with the essential oils that will kill whatever infection you have and you eat it for a day or two and that's that. But even if we had access to a forest, how many of us are so in tune with nature that we could smell out what plants are good for us? Additionally, because we cook our food, all the essential oils get vaporized out. I researched hundreds of essential oils. I put aside the ones that were toxic, and I chose from the ones that were left eight that had the strongest effect against parasites, biofilms, fungi, bacteria, and yeast. Fungi, yeast, and parasites are simple organisms they live on the amino acids glutamine, glutamate, and sugar. Glutamate is what gives food its savory flavor. So if you're craving sweets and savory foods, that's a pretty good sign you have a yeast and or parasitic infection. On the other hand, bitter foods are what kill them. So if you dislike bitter foods, that's another sign. You see, parasites and yeast have learned how to manipulate us our behaviors, our tastes. They make us like what they like, sweet and savory things, and dislike what they hate, bitter things, because bitter foods typically kill parasites and yeast. One of the interesting things that happens when you start killing parasites, yeast, and fungi is your tastes change. It's not that you don't like sweet and savory foods, but you don't crave them. You enjoy them when they're there and bitter foods don't bother you so much. As a matter of fact, you might find your requirements for food and sleep decrease. This is because when you're no longer feeding billions of parasites and fungi, you don't need as much food. And when you're not repairing the damage they cause every day, you don't need that much sleep. Another sign for parasites and fungal infections is moodiness and trouble sleeping. The way parasites and fungi get us to do what they want is by secreting neurochemicals. They change what we want, but they also change our moods and our behaviors. One of the things you'll notice when you clear these out of your body is you just become a happier, calmer person. Eating essential oils is what tells all of these composters, I'm fully alive, fully vital, move along. For scar tissue, I like to use serapeptase. It's the enzyme that silkworms use to digest their way out of their cocoons. It turns out that cocoons are very similar to scar tissue in this manner. The challenge is that only 5% of serapeptase survives digestion, so I prefer to take it as a suppository. Castor oil packs are very effective with scars. They've been around since the times of ancient Egypt. The challenge is they're very messy. So what we've done is to design a special 
castor patch where you put a castor oil material on a bandage and place it against the skin and it seals up so the oil doesn't leak everywhere. It's a great protocol. When you add the serapeptase internally and the castor packs externally, you've got a great protocol for scar tissue in the body. In addition to essential oils, I like elagic acid. It blocks the enzyme chitin synthase, which is what fungi need to build their cell walls. It blocks the enzyme integrase, which a lot of viruses need to enter cells to replicate. And it blocks the enzyme gyrase, which is what allows bacterial DNA to coil properly, thus making the DNA of the bacteria completely unspool inside the bacteria. Between elagic acid and essential oils, I think you've got a really great protocol for biofilms, fungi, bacteria, parasite, and viruses.